Hi, my name is Paul from Physics High and welcome to Ansto's National Research Cyclotron based here in Camperdown, Sydney. This is the second video on the cyclotron, but rather than just looking at the theory today, I want to give you a bit of a virtual tour of the cyclotron, how it works, particularly in real life and also its applications in research. to Andrew who is the facilities uh, manager. Hi Andrew Hi, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to explore the cyclotron. Pleasure, thank you for coming down. Now uh, tell us a little bit more about the cyclotron and, and what it does here. Great, yeah well, first of all we're one of several cyclotrons in Australia. Uh, we're actually in a very very unique position in that we're actually not either a commercial operation nor linked directly to a, a hospital. Most of the other cyclotrons, they're dealing with either a commercial product FDG or uh, FDG specifically for patients within their hospital or the national public uh, FDG network. Here we are a research cyclotron. So whilst we do make FDG as a backup supply for Australia, predominantly what we're looking for is new and novel or the next radio tracer for Australians. So that gives us a unique position where uh, an ANSTO, we're an Australian federal government organisation and predominantly we look at uh, research or new and novel radio pharmaceuticals. So here is our cyclotron, it's an, it's an 18 MeV, uh, that means 18 mega electron volts. We previously had a, a 30 MeV cyclotron here at uh, Camperdown, uh, that was an older cyclotron that came to the end of its life. It was really, really good at making isotopes such as I-123, I-131, thallium and gallium. Uh, now, exclusively here at the moment, we deal with F18, fluorine 18, and C11, carbon 11. And the 18 MeV is perfect for those two isotopes. But we have, we have eight ports potentially on this particular cyclotron where we can attach different targetry and perform different sorts of reactions to make different isotopes. Uh, what are the main isotopes that you produce here? Well, we only have the two isotopes running at the moment, a large F18 target, small F18 target and then four carbon targets. So F18 is a wonderful isotope, it has a two hour half-life that makes it right in the Goldilocks zone of being able to produce, label chemically, quality control and then transport around the country and still have enough of it available to inject into a patient for some diagnostic scanning. It's the perfect isotope for that. Carbon 11 on the other hand only has a 20 minute half-life. Uh, so it's really, really difficult to produce enough of it to begin with, to then have enough time to label it chemically. There's almost no time to do quality control testing and it's very, very difficult to transport it out. So why, for example, do you use carbon? So the, the only reason we use it is because it's carbon-based and the world, us, we're all made of carbon, makes it a really, really good isotope to work with chemically. It's very, very handy to, to, to label. So it's a wonderful isotope to use to develop and find the next radio tracer which we can then expand up into F18 and potentially deliver to uh, Australians down the future. So now we get into the nitty gritty, particularly of how the cyclotron works. Now I assume you've already watched my video where we talk about a magnetic field turns the charged particles and we have an electric field that accelerates those charged particles. But how does it actually work in real life? I have with me here, I have Michael who is the cyclotron specialist. So Michael, tell us a little bit about how this cyclotron works. All right, like in all particle accelerators, there is the magnet. This is the top magnet, this is the bottom magnet. Magnets keep it into its uh, plane. So in this plane here is where the RF resides and particle starts in the center of the cyclotron. The RF with the magnet accelerates the particle in a cyclic path. Once the particle reaches the edge of the cyclotron, we put in its pathway foils. These foils strip the electrons off the proton and the proton automatically, due to physics, wants to spin in the opposite direction. And that's in, in that direction, we have a target. And the target is bombarded by the protons. We have two targets here, a C11 target and an F18 target. We've got a carbon target, as you said, and a fluorine target, but this one's got a great big box around it. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Okay, this is essentially a shield. During the production of F18, neutrons are admitted and pretty much they're really dangerous, so we keep them in this box 
and we stop it from irradiating everything on the wall, otherwise everything on the wall will become radioactive. Lastly, can you tell me a little bit more about the cabling that's going on here? The white tubings here are cooling water. When the target is getting bombarded, it heats up and we need to cool it essentially, otherwise it will melt. These metal lines here are, is how we transfer the target gas from the cyclotron to the hot cells. These metal lines run underground and all the way to the hot cells. So now let's move to the control centre. Tell me, uh, Michael, um, tell me what's uh, happening here at the, what do you do here at the control centre? Uh, this is the control room, so this is where we control all the magnets and the RF and the iron source. We also control the, the foil. Um, the carbon foil is how we strip the ions, the, elect uh, the electrons off the proton beam and we have this how we change a negative beam into a positive beam. And once it becomes a positive beam, we can direct it into a target. Um, how we angle it into a target is we control the angle of where the actual beam hits um, the carbon foil. So this carbon foil is actually $600. And wow. yeah, it's pretty much a very thin foil of carbon and it has the consistency of ash. So it's very, very fragile and it's very delicate. This little box here, $600, its only job is to make hydride ions into protons. Wow, how many of these do you go through in a year? Uh, so each target has two of these and we change them every six months to see. See, every six months to a year we change them, so that's around um, 16 of them a year. Wow, thanks. No worries. So that was the basics of the cyclotron itself, and particularly how it's controlled and monitored. But now what we want to do is have a look at what happens to the actual products that it produces. So we're heading off to the hot cells. And now we're in the part of the facility which is referred to as the hot cells. And I have a radio chemist here, Lawson, who's going to explain a little bit about uh, the work that he does, but also what happens here at the hot cell. Lawson, tell us a little bit more of what you do with the F18 that's produced in the cyclotron. So uh, what we do uh, with the F18 that's produced in the cyclotron is uh, we label biological compounds that are able to um, effectively diagnose uh, specific diseases that people with uh, health issues might have. So uh, in this facility we are looking at developing uh, more new and up and coming traces rather than producing already developed ones. So we take uh, say what might be uh, an early academic idea and try and translate that to the point where it could be uh, produced for some preclinical imaging with animals. And then after that point, um, if it uh, shows promise, then we can uh, use uh, the method and the um, techniques that we've developed here and translate that into our GMP team can be used for humans. So do you want to open up the hot cell? But by the way, it hasn't got any radioactive substances in it, so we're actually allowed to open it. So tell me the basics of the hot cell here. Yeah, so uh, here we have an automated uh, radiochemistry synthesis module. So essentially it's an organic chemistry lab on a box. It's capable of advanced chemical manipulations. The reason for that is, is because once the radioactive materials are transferred from the cyclotron uh, into the hot cell, we can't reaccess it for our safety. So we need to be able to do all these things remotely. Fluorine 18 is transferred from the cyclotron in two mils of the oxygen 18 enriched water uh, with the fluorine 18 contained in that. So we want to trap the fluorine 18 and um, allow the, the liquid to continue on. In doing that, we're able to purify out the impurities that are also generated uh, through the irradiation process. So we want to be uh, able to use just the pure F18 uh, in our chemical manipulations. So on this box, we're capable of um, doing uh, full chemistry reactions with uh, many different reagents. It's also capable of the purification uh, and formulation of the product. So we can essentially do everything in one location very fast. The primary difference um, between, I would say, radiochemistry and uh, regular chem benchtop chemistry is the fact that we've got our time against us. So the product is decaying just as fast as we're making it. Uh, so we need to be able to have a fast, effective, efficient reaction uh, that can be purified quickly. That's great. So Lawson, tell me specifically, what's the project that you're working on? 
One of the primary projects we're working on at the moment is um, a radio tracer uh, for a collaborator at the Brain and Mind Centre. Um, it is a radio tracer that is capable of uh, imaging the receptors on synapses and so it is uh, primarily used to image uh, synaptic density. So the reason that's important is uh, there are a lot of um, health issues that uh, can impact on, on your synaptic density in the brain. So what this tracer hopefully is capable of doing could be to diagnose um, using imaging techniques like things like post-traumatic stress or uh, if someone has damage to their spinal column, how it's uh, repairing, uh, things of that nature. Thanks Lawson, that was really helpful. And our last part of the tour is looking at quality control. So let's go to that section. An important part, of course, of production of any materials here at the Cyclotron is quality control. And again, we are talking here to Andrew, the manager of the facility. So Andrew, how does quality control happen here at the Research Cyclotron? Great question. As you pointed out, it's crucial that we do quality control, uh, provide what's called quality assurance, which is the umbrella sort of uh, term. So everything that we ultimately produced from this, this facility. The reason for that is it's ending up in people and we need to make sure that what we give to people is of the absolute highest quality. In order to make sure that we've made exactly what we, we thought we made and what we want to make, we do quality assurance. Quality assurance means quality control machines and I'll take you through a few mm. of those. So simply over here, pH, that's a rather simple one. If we're out of pH and injecting into the bloodstream, it can be very damaging to the body. We move on to something more complicated. This is actually an endotoxin test, uh, test machine. Microorganisms are bad for all the obvious reasons. So microorganisms, even under a uh, destruction process, will actually release some of these toxins. And that's the thing that actually gives you a fever and makes you feel a little bit sick sometimes. So this machine here will actually detect the presence of those endotoxins in the products well before we've even uh, detected the microorganisms themselves. So it's a really, really good test. So next we've got a, a, a gamma spec and what we're establishing with this test is that we've made F18 and nothing else. Whilst 99.99999% of what comes off the cyclotron is F18, there's that very, very tiny amount that will be there from um, impurities in our target material or even in the target body itself. Uh, those are potentially, potentially uh, unhelpful for, for the body. So that's what this machine does. It makes sure that Lawson's process, where he removes those impurities from the cyclotron, has actually worked. So this, this is actually the filter that uh, Lawson will attach to his synthesis unit and this will actually capture any of those impurities, no matter how small, come off our cyclotron. Oh. And this is what we collect our waste effectively. Our radioactive waste is effectively collected into one of these things. By just pointing at that size, I gather that the amount of waste you produce in this facility is extremely small considering the work that you do here. It's tiny, yes. Yeah. So next we've got uh, gas chromatography. Part of the synthesis process involves solvents. Those solvents are really, really important for binding the tracer to the isotope. Whilst that's really, really crucial for that binding process, after that process has occurred, we actually want to get rid of as much of those solvents as possible. They're not wonderful things for the human body. And the synthesis process that Lawson uh, took you through earlier deals with a lot of those wastes. This machine tells us that Lawson has done that correctly. Lastly, we have the HPLC. This is a machine that effectively uh, gives us a chemical fingerprint of the product and we can match up and say, yes, we've actually made the product that we thought we made and we wanted to make. Fantastic. Thanks very much. No problems. Cool. Well, I hope that it has been informative to learn a little bit more about Ansto's National Research Cyclotron. I particularly want to thank Lawson, Andrew and Michael with their assistance for this video and their generosity of their time, as well as Rod Dowler from Ansto. Please like, share and subscribe. Put a comment down below if this video has been helpful for you. And of course, feel free to ask a question or two. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care. Bye for now.